Hello, everyone. You're meeting two very uh, decent jet-lagged souls who've, <laughs> who've come all the way from New Delhi, but we will, we will, we will, we are in good rhythm. <laughs> Hi, Fira. Hello. Uh, like Mira said, we've uh, Mira had a 35-hour flight from Delhi. Uh, I had a 28-hour flight, uh, so I've sort of prepared all night for this because I was up. <laughs> Um, also, can I just say, it's so nice to have this sort of a conversation and the fact that it's a freewheeling chat without a moderator, I think, is a great idea. So thank you for doing this. I, I mean this in a non-trivial way. Uh, this is great fun. Truly. And uh, it's also a huge honor, of course, to be talking to Meera, who obviously is a behemoth in uh, filmmaking across the world and was genuinely a, a, a hero uh, growing up. And I thought we could kick off this conversation by actually talking about one aspect of your early films that I thought was fabulous and always found a bit inscrutable in terms of how you achieved it in terms of craft. Uh, what always stands out uh, f for anyone who's seen uh, Mira's films like uh, Mississippi or Monsoon Wedding or Salam Bombay is the incredible density that those films are able to achieve. And it's a kind of density that you know, a lot of, whenever there's um, Western perspectives on India, you have a kind of a way in which the mise-en-scene of that world is achieved. But I feel like Mira was able to get a sense of density that was rare and full of a kind of plenitude that we encounter in the country often. So I just want to talk about how those first films were and how the movement to the subsequent films have happened, which have become more sort of sparser in their form and craft. Sorry for the big question, but... Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Shonak. Thank you. Um, it's also wonderful to be in conversation with Shonak, who I only got to know through his extraordinary film, All That Breeds. I had never seen, actually, a film like that. And I've come from cinema verite, really pure cinema verite training uh, in my own work. And you had a kind of cinema verite, again, to a Delhi eye. We are very, like most of us, we are very acerbic and astute about our own societies. And when people come from the outside or even from within trying to make it more palatable to the West or to the international scene. I have a very high antenna for that. So what uh, of not doing that actually. And, and uh, what was interesting and beautiful about All That Breeds was it was about something so deeply real, but also like uh, iconoclastically cinematic in, in a narrative almost sense, although these were real people with real dilemmas and real beautiful healings. So it's a real pleasure for me to talk to someone I uh, admire and who's also from the same ground that I come from. Um, thank you for the question of density. That is pretty much one of my favorite aspirations in my work. Uh, and I came to making films through firstly and completely a study of cinema vahite. Uh, my teachers were uh, Ricky Leacock and D.A. Pennybaker. I, I took my first course in film at MIT when I was uh, 19. And it was really about preserving the truth, very different from the documentaries that we see today. It was really about just going into a world and learning how to be trusted by that world and then entering that world visually. But my other training, besides the streets themselves and people themselves, was photography. And this was, a, uh, uh, this, was, this was the way that I learned to make a frame and to also keep a frame as, as sacred and then as layered as possible, but without the sifting of the frame is, is key to my way of thinking and looking, you know, it's not about everything. I hate the line that people say when they come to India, oh, you can shoot, point a camera anywhere and you've got something. It makes me puke, you know, because uh, it's not like that at all, you know. And in fact, a lot of people do that and it's, I immediately see it. But with the study, I suppose, of, of living on the streets, of learning how to, you know, my first, one of my early films, documentaries I made for seven years, was called India Cabaret. And it was about uh, it was what uh, about the line that divides good women from bad so-called bad women in our society, and it's inevitably sexuality and economics that that creates that line. 
Um, and I lived and literally lived and was seen as a stripper for several months to the deep chagrin of my bourgeois parents in Delhi. Oh, Mira, oh, she's not here anymore. I, I don't know where she went. Uh, you know, uh, 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 no, 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 Mira, it, um, I, uh, my other two sons are there, and if you'd like to, you know. So it was like that for a long time. But what happens when you live like that is you literally uh, suffer the vicissitudes, the, 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 the challenges, the double standards, the... The, the daggers of society upon you, you know, and you literally feel what your subjects are feeling. Um, anyway, all of this to say that I began to, of course, have a deep sense of humility, but the visual craft was always imperative, and that was what finally led me to make uh, fiction, uh, because I, I was tiring of, like, wanting the gesture to be a certain way, wanting the light to be a certain way in my documentaries, making a narrative of these of the Cinema Verite documentaries, which is also a great connect to what you have done. Um, and that's why when I, one of the, one of the episodes in, in India Cabaret where I lived with these women and, 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 and I woke up with them, they, we would come home from the club at about 3 a.m. and sleep till noon. And, and, and these little boys, the tea boys, would come to uh, wake them up with hot tea. And they would, it was this wonderful reversal of roles where they would, uh, they would command the boy to dance like the men had commanded them to dance the night before. They would say, Nacho, and then the boy would dance uh, with the one tuneless tune he knew and serve them tea. Anyway, this was one of the kernels of an idea that led me to want to make a film about street kids and how they insist on a childhood despite having nothing. And that was my first fiction film, Salam Bombay. But again, I, I also, um, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> thank you. Um, I also worked with, uh, very closely with Mitch Epstein, who is a photographer, still photographer, who, and we were together, we were married, we got married later, but uh, we, and he was a major uh, teacher in a sense just through the world of photography at that time. He came from Cooper Union, Gary Winogren was a friend, you know, Lee Friedlander, uh, Bill Eggleston. I mean, these were our circle. And, and the, the whole way of seeing was deeply informed by, by classic photography and contemporary American photography. And that was something that really fueled me and has fueled me forever. Um, and I think that taught me how to sift, you know, how to not make the frame about everything, you know. Uh, but the world, and you make cinema very thin, you can't sift, you know, you, can't, you see what it is, but it's how you film it that is a sifting, you know. Um, Can of you course, give an example? Um, yeah, um, in, in, um, in India Cabaret, they, they, they are not real strippers, they're just, uh, they're dancers to reveal their bodies for a brief moment, and then as soon as they have stripped naked, they put this flowered cheap cloth on them, and then they come back to the green room, and in the green room, they are deeply modest women who, you know, change, even though it's their own green room, under this flowered cloth. So, how one shoots that, you know, is an example. It's hard to do without showing you, mm -hmm. but it's 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 how one shoots the cloth on their bodies, sometimes revealing, sometimes not. The knock on the door of a, you know, lunch boy who comes in offering an omelet, but really is concerned that they cannot, they should eat because before the next show, and this kind of interplay between right. caring yeah. and modesty. It's also how you f frame it and how you shoot it. You know, you could, if you wanted, they are there, you are there, you could do the whole thing. You could show everything you want. Yeah. But it's how you shoot it, how you create that frame, it actually creates almost a sense of mystery, yeah. you know? Um, that was, I think, my learning from all this, the photography, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, so, and, and that continued and, until making Salam Bombay mm -hmm. where, it was with real kids. Uh, we, 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 you know, we hired about 20, 129 street kids. We offered them the money that they would make as rag pickers and as in their normal lives. And then we, I chose 29 of them, and they were all in the film after a long workshop. But how you see the streets, for instance, um, in the brothels of Kamatipura in Bombay, 
I was a great frequenter of the brothels. And you know, the way we use color in India is extraordinarily startling. So one wall in the brothel commonly was fuchsia. You know, The other walls are that deep, weird uh, blue green, which is supposed to prevent mosquitoes, but does nothing of the sort. <laughs> and, 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 and so this fuchsia wall struck me. And we were shooting in real brothels. And the way I wanted this particular real brothel, so I simply asked the madame if I could paint that room the same fuchsia as in brothel number or 102, and she allowed me. Or, or the, the kids sleep on the streets, and everyone pisses on the streets and defecates on the streets. But the only place that they don't piss and defecate is when there are gods painted on the walls. And the gods that are painted, these wonderful, now it's kind of fashionable to look at, what do they call it, folk art, or primitive art, or nonsense stuff like that. But we, I just looked at those icons of Jesus, you know, Jesus, um, Krishna, this and that, and we, we painted those folk, whatever, the, those naive art uh, in, our, in our set, which was on the street anyway. And you know, like how you see what you see in the real world and make it part of your frame, you know? So that kind of thing, but mostly it is to do with how you see, you know? Because you can see the train stations of India in hundreds of ways. You know, um, Danny Boyle, you know, worked with me very, very carefully before he made Slumdog. <laughs> uh, for, uh, better or for worse, uh, there, there was there was some parts that he really got, and the some parts uh, that it was very different. But anyway, but it was about how to see the world. You know, how to see the madness and beautiful layerings of what happens of the myriad things that can happen on a train station or in a train compartment. Anyway, so that's that's how I start to look at the world and I've always sort of looked at the world, um, but also very carefully not ever to pander to what people expect of India and its turbulence and its, you know, uh, and its madness and all of that. It is a sifting that goes from start to finish. But I do love, I do love the density. I love the density after the sifting, the density of how you add music, you know, and it's not the, it's not the cloying music that often is slapped on from start to finish. But so much of the use of music for me is very freewheeling between an, a classical song, a boatman song, a, a old Indian, love, a, a old Indian movie song. The fantasies we are given in India, regardless of class, is so much communicated through music and through, um, through not dialogue, but actually that music. So using it in this kind of untraditional fashion has somehow, in, in hindsight, become a bit of a signature. Yeah. Uh, so I have a million questions. I, I don't know why I'm acting like an interviewer. I know this isn't that. But I have a question that I, uh, I absolutely must ask, which is um, if one zooms out a bit and um, talks about how one conducts life as a filmmaker, and the kind of rigor that you brought to bear upon your practice. Um, one of the things that I've always noticed about filmmakers who've had a long career is that, you know, in the first bit of their career, you feel like there's a, there's a pure instinct that's raw and unvarnished. And slowly a craft kind of develops, right? A language that is typical of the filmmaker develops. In the second half of a lot of filmmakers' careers, what you see is that that originary instinct might begin to fade and craft takes over, right? Because it's a muscle that people have built. Now, in your films, there's no, it's not like a clear through line that one can trace, which I mean in the best possible sense of the word. And we were recently speaking about your working on a screenplay right now. So how do you, like, can you speak a little about, like, comporting life as a, you know, the everyday practice of making art or working with imagination and how at this point when you're writing your first screenplay I imagine alone, yeah. and you've never done that before right not alone yeah so I want to uh, you know can you talk a little about the process of starting that now at this point and you know like how uh, you go about things and then I'm going to turn that question yeah. to you please yeah. because I'm curious as well um, you know I um, have never felt jaded or like tired of making something. I always have this feeling of hunger and 
sometimes doubt also, can I do it, can I not? I've always worked with writers very, very closely, but never uh, wanted or taken credit because I believe we get enough credit as directors and, and it's fine, you know. But I also similarly have not faced the screen alone, you know, uh, of writing or the page. Um, and um, this is a film I'm making now, a fiction film, on Amrita Shergill, who is the great pioneer of modern art in India, very much in shorthand to say, uh, like our Frida Kahlo from, uh, from the East, except that she was half Hungarian and half Sikh, and it deeply embodied both East and West. Uh, the youngest student in Beaux Arts in Paris uh, moved to India from the age of eight, then 20, and, and looked at India with the eyes of who she was, I find myself deeply aligned with her because she has the eyes sometimes of an outsider and yet felt a through line to the insider, to the subjects of her work, which were largely, largely ordinary people, largely women, largely longing, and, and created a style of painting and framing and seeing that has become, was a deep influence, has always been on all my films, whether it to do with color palette or how to see or even how to frame. So I, when I make feature films, I make these lookbooks that I share with my team, with my financiers, uh, lookbooks that also include music. At, uh, at what stage? Early, uh, like after, as we've developed, this, the script is done and I make this book alongside it, because again, photography being such a fuel for me, and, and also, Seanak, I'm sure you'll, but in, when I began here in New York and America, they didn't know how to spell the word India. You know, yeah. they didn't know where the fuck we came from. Yeah. And yeah. so, uh, it, it was, all, and yet, I had some credentials that they understood, like I went to Harvard, so I had a scholarship to Harvard when I was 18 from a little village in, a little town in Orissa, and so when they had that little chap, the trademark of, oh, she's been here, she knows how we talk and think, although they still ask me, how do you speak such good English? But anyway, um, uh, but, but you know, then you still have to make the world come alive for them. And, and I've always made films like, okay, Salam Bombay is from the street, but Reluctant Fundamentalist is from, say, Pakistan, uh, Malaysia, uh, Wall Street, you know, New York City, the high life, uh, Oyster Bay. I mean, it's all these worlds that have to, uh, that are seen as one, firstly by the novelist uh, Mohsin Hamid, but, but I have to translate it visually into yeah. something that a financier <laughs> might see. Yeah. So I make these books, and in, Almost if you would look at all of my lookbooks, they always have Amrita Shergill in them, in some fashion or the other, mostly to do with the stripping away, with the sifting, with the modernist design of, let's say, a striped sari against, a, against, a, against the expanse of the Ganges, for instance. You know, it's a way of seeing. Anyway, that's why I was so drawn to her. A lot of people are drawn to her. There have been something like 15 films being attempted to be made on Amrita that have never been made. And I'm now financed and hopefully ready to go. But I'm writing this screenplay yeah. because the, the a writer that had earlier, I mean, I had helped a lot, this writer that had been chosen by a producer. And I, at the end of it, I just thought, this is not the film I'm going to be wanting to make. And I also understand that it's not a purely commercial film, that it's not going to be a blockbuster. You know, it's a personal film almost, yes. and it needs to be made with that engagement from me, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So that's why I started to write it yeah. myself. Yeah. And um, at first it was, it, it is not as daunting as I thought first, at first, but of course it's deeply daunting, you know? How long? The film? Have you been writing? Oh, I wrote the first draft uh, of mine, uh, April 2021, and then I got financed uh, mostly for that on that draft, and then I was de I put it away for two years because I made Monsoon Wedding a musical for Broadway, uh, heading to uh, heading to Broadway, uh, that opened in St Anne's Warehouse in Brooklyn uh, last year. So I got completely involved with that, and now, uh, as in August, I just went back into re rewriting the screenplay, and you know. I it's 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 very tough because um well, it's just plain tough. You know, whether you do a cradle to grave kind of biopic, whether you do the last three months, you know, whether you do, I mean, everyone's talking to me for endlessly about Maestro and how this whole life has been seen through the the the, the, the wife and the the, family, the marriage. So, you know, it's all those, any angle you can take into the reading of a life, yeah. an artistic life. Yeah. And so, but I still, uh, it still slightly is elusive and I'm searching for that, what is, what 
what should be the the way in, you know, fully in. It's going, but uh, but it is beautifully tough. And uh, like we were discussing, you know, one one day you can get an extraordinary idea, which I know is pretty good because I've yeah. been around the block. Yeah. And the next day, uh, nothing can happen yeah. for several days. Yeah. And how you do that, you know? Yeah. But tell me how you do it. <laughs> how do you live your life, as you were saying, uh, uh, as a filmmaker? and comport your life? I mean, that's another, actually another question beyond the screenplay, but I, was, I would be so curious. Well, uh, we started with, uh, well, documentary is a different kind of a circuit in that uh, because there's no funding, largely from India, there's a kind of an endemic westward facingness, which you constantly have to contest and sort of undercut yourself. But the thing is that I, my main sort of interest initially was really craft. And I don't feel like an outsider. Mm -hmm. I, I've lived there all my life. I have often you know, had small spurts outside the country. But I feel very embedded and very vernacular and colloquial. Uh, so my main interest was a sort of like, uh, was craft in how one is able to cinematically render uh, an intensity that I was interested in. Um, now, the thing is that with documentaries, there's a very set pattern in how docs from that part of the world are seen, which is that this really annoying, mutually exclusive binary as if, where, you know, docs from uh, that part of the world have to carry the burden of being social. Yeah. You know, everything is about disenfranchisement or you're constantly, it has to be about an issue. Mm -hmm. Whereas it's the European or North American docs who, were dealing with the really delicious issues of existential yeah. crises. And, and of course, you feel like, why can't? And I'm, my core interest is, you know, it's conceptual and philosophical and aesthetic. And I don't want to constantly carry the burden of the social. Mm -hmm. And because what that does is that it has a kind of a flattening out. And I think it only perpetuates something of a familiar regime that already is you know, situated in the world. So in a way, I was interested in, and my characters are, you know, they're like philosophers. You can take lines that they have said and mm -hmm. replace it and say that Foucault has said it, and you'd believe it, right? Yeah. So it's, uh, we had to kind of find a grammar that was consonant with, so it was interesting because when you were talking about um, Salam Bombay uh, or the early films, it sounds like because a part of your brain was also so influenced by observational verite style. So it's almost like the concatenation of non-fiction filmmaking brought to bear upon fiction filmmaking. And for me, I think it is exactly the opposite, which is that I was really eager to use the toys of fiction to tell a non-fiction story. So, you know, which is to say that usually um, uh, you don't use things like cranes and tracks and these slow takes in docs, but one of the main sort of interests that we had, and one of the editors, Vedant, is actually in the audience, is uh, the our interest was in it should almost look like the outer wrapping is of a Tarkovsky film, you know? And uh, my heroes were people who worked with this kind of a durational elliptical form, like, um, Tarkovsky or, uh, you know, in documentary fil filmmakers like Viktor Kosakovsky and so on. So to be able to try and find a form where it almost resembles fiction in a way, but holds on to some of the political concerns, albeit not frontly, but obliquely and tangentially, where you feel like it's the epistemic wallpaper of this world, where you feel like you... And I think it's more interesting, like how one puts in the political in a film is interesting in that when a film is, when it's too frontal in its politics, it's too naked in showing what it's, you know, it becomes too prescriptive or pedantic or a bit blueprinty. And you know you feel like, and a lot of these docs actually do more disservice, I think, than it's any. Agit prop. It's like yeah, because it's like you're holding the audience by the collar and saying feel bad, and you know it's a bit, you know, it it never does any good. And I think it's more interesting when one Trojan horses ideas, and you're able to emotionally move people in having conversations that they don't want to actually have, and that's our skill. So it was this sort of broader constellation of things that we were interested in, but when we began the main idea really was form and concepts. And that's what, how we sort of initially began. In terms of going ahead, I, I mean, the tougher part of what you asked is how one conducts one life as a, I don't know, it's a, I'm, 
I'm not anxious or restless, but I, um, I'm definitely not confident um, in terms of, um, I don't feel secure, for sure. And it feels like we moved worlds in trying to make a film wherein, you know, I, I lost a parent in the middle, I, everybody felt sick, the pandemic was in the middle, and you felt like you really had to, you know, change the axis of the world that you were looking at. And uh, that's obviously not a sustainable model. And I'm, like I was mentioning, interested in fiction now, and I'm writing a fiction script. But, you know, I don't feel um, situated. Um, and I don't know where one, which of course is also a good thing, but um, what's encouraging and inspiring for me to see when I hear somebody like you is, uh, you know that there is some sort of a path that can be taken, and I don't mean this in a in a silly uh, uh, you know an artist must find it their way sort of a way, uh, but it's a um, because there is no set pattern in terms of how because one doesn't want to stay limited to only telling stories from okay. India alone, and you know I want to be a filmmaker who can tell any stories, and the inspiring thing about you is that you've told all kinds of stories, so how one positions oneself in terms of looking westwards or looking back at home is something that you know uh, we're all sort of still grappling with. Mm. No, it's something I also grapple with because I, I, I say, you know, it's because my roots are strong that I could fly. I'm very much, I never left India till I was 19, 18, 19. And that is still the source of my family life, my inspiration in so many ways and so, so on. But I feel it now after so many years in New York City and New York is such a special <laughs> country on its own in terms of ha being a home for so many of us who have come from so many places with excellence and, and creative rigor being pretty much a common, that's where I found my cre creative community. And But still, without that feeling at home, having a sense of going back to India with these eyes that 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 are not numbed by seeing something every day that one sees in India, people, you know, we just stop seeing in certain ways. Um, and that was an interesting, see that is an interesting seesaw. Um, but at the same time, I didn't want to be on the A-list in Hollywood making rom-coms of, you know, two kids who are not of my color for sure. And, 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 and you know, I mean, I could have, I could have, but I really, like, strongly resisted being on those lists and wanting to do my own thing. And that, of course, is a certain, it, it, it gives you all those things, loneliness, insecurity, <laughs> you know, the drive, uh, and, 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 you know, so that's been interesting, you know, not wanting to join the pack. Can I ask you something about yeah. that? Sorry to interrupt. Um, how do you say no? W what's the criterion that you deploy when, you know, it's always tempting because... Uh, My big criteria is if I can think of anybody else who can make that film, they should make it, not me. And one time I've dropped that ball because of certain reasons, you know, where I made a film, I was, I was making a film, uh, I, so that's the, that's the criteria I employ. It's like, if I can think of five people who can make that film, or kinds of people, they should make that film. You know, why have you come to me? I'm a very peculiar sort, and I will make the film in a peculiar, you know, my way. Uh, or, and also it's very unusual for me to accept a film that comes from the outside, unless it is sent to me by somebody I love and respect. Like my friend Lydia Pilcher is in the audience, my producer from many, many 15 films or God knows how many we've made together. And one time uh, she and Uma Thurman, who's a friend, sent me Hysterical Blindness, a wonderful, honest, abrasive, you know, working class truths of a fi of set in Bayonne, New Jersey, you know, and, and, um, and uh, I just loved the honesty and the, and the, it's almost cringeworthy. It's about a girl in Bayonne, New Jersey, who slept with pretty much everybody in town and then a new guy comes in and she has to have him and what's she gonna do, you know? And of course the problem was it was Uma Thurman. <laughs> who was playing that role, and I said, oh my, you know, like, how do we make you uh, cringeworthy? Anyway, uh, but, but the honesty of the writing and the way of telling and the way of seeing was written by a woman, uh, Laura Cahill, a playwright, the wonderful writing, and I loved it. And, um, and also it's interesting, you know, because 
I, I, I love so many Western actors. You know, I love so many actors that I would like to work with, but I don't think of them because I don't think of the worlds in which they can be. So I, I was one of the big reasons I also said yes to hysterical was oh, this way I could cast, you know, Cassavetes is a hero of mine, like so many of us, and, and this way I could cast, you know, Ben Gazzara, he said yes, uh, Jenna Rollins, she said yes, Juliette Lewis, she said yes. I mean, every, and of course Uma was there, so all, all these great actors that I can never think of in my own work, in a way, uh, like, naturally, you know, um, and I could, I, I made that film, but it's an unusual choice, you know, for me. But I really enjoyed it because it's about pure cinema craft, but with wonderful people whom I've loved and who are willing, who are as adventurous as any of us, you know, to do something different and new. Um, I, I meet, I met uh, Juliet uh, in a red a red carpet line about five. My, oh no, a year ago, and we were all a little bit tipsy, and I, you know, she said, oh, Vera, when are you gonna think of me next? And, she, I, and I said, the minute I think about white people, I'll think about you. <laughs> she said, did you really say that? I said, yeah, I said that. <laughs> you know? But it is like that, you know, I don't think, <laughs> no, <laughs> I think I fully get it. <laughs> So it's like that. And uh, sometimes uh, there'll be other films like Vanity Fair I made with Reese Witherspoon, and that was a film, a book, you know, how we were raised so literarily, you know, and Thackeray and that book was about the first badass chick I'd ever read when I was 16 in a convent in Simla, you know, and I loved Becky Sharp, and I just was saying, yes, I'll do that, you know. So it's different ways that I can say yes to things that come yeah. from outside me, yeah. but mostly I'm re responding to myself. Uh, can we talk a little more about responding to yourself? Mm. Uh, can you describe, uh, this is going to be a horribly vague and ineffable question, but uh, can you describe um, the process of first getting an idea, like when it first comes? I can start, start it off. So uh, for me, it feels like an ineffable glow at the back of my head, where you feel like there's you know, like some sort of new neural clusters are firing. <laughs> Because some, you know, like I started off uh, by making a film on sleeping, a film called Cities of Sleep, like a small run and gun, raw, uh, like observational film. But what was really interesting was I felt that it was deeply speaking to something of my experience and also something that I was philosophically interested in. And uh, similarly with this film, there was something about this sort of uh, the dystopic, with all that breeze, there was this dystopic picture postcard of Delhi, which is the gray, hazy, monochromatic expanse and these tiny black dots, which are the black kites, gliding lazily in the sky. And that sort of image became, you know, symptomatic of the texture or tone of living in the city, but also it, you know, it emotionally does something. Or when one comes across an idea more intellectually, like conceptually, and wants to sort of play with that. So uh, for you, what's the, like, can you speak a little about the first sort of you know, effervescent spark of an idea. Like, what does that look like for you? Well, um, I've always, to give an example, I've always been interested in class and the depravity of class uh, in our societies, as you know it. And as India has boomed and economic this and prosperity that, this notion of class and the division of class is just insane now. And in my growing up in socialist India, it was not about ostentation. You may have had money, but you'd never show it. Today's India is all about, you know, the six Porsches and the neighbor and the so-and-so and the so-and-so. You know, it's so glaringly visible. And long, for a long time, I've always been interested in, in, in well, Kurosawa's film High and Low is one of my favorite films for years. And I never wanted to, I never want to remake anything, I never want to do that. But I was looking at that type of an idea, how to speak about class in our society, and today it is even more depraved. And uh, uh, six, I mean, and the, I think it's the training of Cinema Bahite that I'm very alive to the newspapers, I'm very alive to what people talk about, I'm very alive to just cocktail party stories even, you know, and I was told a story seven years ago yeah. by, um, by the wife of my brother's best friend who used to be the ex-daughter-in-law of a large 
arm dealing arm dealers family in delhi and um, and she told me this story about a horrific case we you know all the case of bmw murders this boy who had his father's bmw ran over six people who he killed in the delhi fog and and so on we all know that story more or less but she told me i'm not going to reveal it she told me an aspect of the that story that was completely unknown from within the family what the father did to protect his boy who was now in jail and that really rang a bell and the, for the thing about it, it's not the glow for me it's about an idea that catches on to me and i won't let go of it whatever else i'm doing i'm sometimes thinking about that idea so it's seven years it's taken me to really attack that idea but now i'm making that f film as well it's going to be called bro and it's a it's a it's a it's a, i'm not going to talk about it because it's about you know but it's about class and it's about um revenge and um it's uh, it's about how you know what wealth the the what can i say the impunity of wealth in our society but also how it affects those that it employs and creates havoc in in both in both sides of society uh, sorry to sound yeah. vague but um and it's a kind of film that could become is uh, 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 like as opposed to amrita shergill which is an artistic um you know sort of not love letter i, I don't like that but uh, just sort of a arrow it's it, this film is much more a film about something that people can uh, uh, you know relate to uh, in any society because class exists everywhere it's just how it exists in india is quite a specific thing you know so it's that you know something that grabs hold of me and doesn't let me go and i do have another very um, strong harbinger of uh, what you, like a sort of a person who tells me how to do it which is my son he's he's 30 something and and he he's a politician but he's somebody who uh, i always refer to and i say what do you think you know I, because i was i was i was uh, missing cinema making cinema when i was doing the theater i i I love the theater and all, but it, it, with cinema, you have more, I dare say it, control over, like, the frame is yours at the end of it, you know? Uh, not so in the theater. And anyway, I was dying to return, and I asked Zoran, what should I do? You know, what do you think I should, what are you missing? <laughs> you know? And he referred me to this idea, which I had not forgotten at all. But I immediately then, sp sp you know, swung into action, and now I'm, it's financed, and we're working with a writer, and, you know, and so on. So it's like that, things that catch hold of me, and they don't get diluted by time. You know, and of course, things that you don't see. I mean, if if I see things, you know, I like to make things that I've never seen before myself. You know, if I could. Well, uh, never seeing before is an. No, I shouldn't say that because I'm referring to high and No, low. but it's a very interesting <laughs> kind of a instinct. By the way, if anybody wants to ask questions, I suppose that's okay. Please do. We are just chatting uh -huh. away. <laughs> okay, cool. I we mean, have five minutes before questions. No, in all. No, in all. So yeah. maybe we should. Yeah, I mean, if anybody up. wants to Be ask democratic. Uh, anything, please. Uh, I can ask one more, in which case. Uh, uh, the, um, uh, you said something that you've not seen, and I want to use that as a kind of springboard. So uh, I feel like, uh, can you talk a little about your toolkit of ideas or inspirations in the sense that, for instance, for me, one thing that's changed, I've noticed is that, especially when I'm writing, of course, one has to be very careful of the diet that one you know, like what your eyes are exposed to and what your, you know, the ideas that you're sort of in conversation with. And um, what's changed for me is watching films that I've seen, but now I tend to see a lot of excerpts of it. So, you know, like I'll see um, the entry into the zone in Stalker mm -hmm. over and over. Or, you know, like films that I really love, like say, of late I've been seeing The Double Life of Veronica, uh, different sections constantly. or you know, or bits of books that I really love and you sort of keep, you know, and there's a kind of a intensity in a repetitious watching yeah. or reading of something and then suddenly something starts emanating or glowing, right? Which is very different from what I did a few years ago where I was hungering for new stuff and, you know, like there's a, and now I feel like that tyranny of the novel 
of the new stuff is, uh, you know, it feels a bit oppressive. And um, what at least I'm trying to inculcate is put together a list of film scenes, ideas, bits from, you know, academic books uh, or uh, literature, etc., to keep sort of going back and reading that and, like, see what emerges. And it's a sort of, uh, you know, like a ballpark or a wheelhouse of ideas that I know that I'm interested in, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, what's the, like, what's, what are your techniques? Like, what do you do? In writing. Yeah, or, like, uh, do, you, uh, do you keep a diary of ideas? What does it look like? What's the practice like? Well, um, there's a lot. I, I read. I read some, but it's, uh, you can get bogged down by what you read. And, of course, you try to read about the subject of the, you know, Amrita in this case. And then I get tired of that kind of art criticism angle. Um, I watch films, but uh, but I have this weird thing of like if I don't write, if I don't actually create some pages <laughs> at the end of the day, I feel like I've done nothing, you know. So I have to fuel myself with reading uh, and limit limit the, what I watch. But what I, do the pages look like? Like, is it an outline? Is it just thoughts? No, it's actual scenes with dialogues and so on. But you forget that I've also been doing this for two three years, you know, with other right another writer, and then so I know the world, but I, first I start with making what I call a map of life. You know, this could happen, and then that could happen, and then that could happen. And then when you start writing them, the map doesn't exist. It, 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 you don't follow the map right. fully, you know? You just follow the, I think, instinct of carrying on. And then I look at it again and try to see whether I'm doing too much or too little. And then I get a little bogged down by the structure of things, meaning, I think the structure is all, but the structure isn't all. It's how you write uh, within it that is really everything. It's a conundrum. Okay. conundrum. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think we can conclude here. Um, I, this was really genuinely lovely, Meera. Thank you. And thank, thank you, you for Shona. everybody. <laughs> thank you for coming this early in the morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we open for questions, yeah? Please feel free to. Ask whatever one way. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, I'm Akbar, a huge fan of Monsoon Wedding. It was one of my favorite movies. And seeing Varun on screen where you like you didn't know if he was queer, but he was queer, like was the first time I saw myself. So it was really impactful um, seeing it as a kid. Time has changed so much since that movie was made. Have you explored LGBTQ narratives in South Asia and brown culture for any films and projects? Is that something that you feel it's time to kind of uplift and share those stories? I mean, I'm open, but I always say that you should, you know, people, th that people should tell their own stories rather than me tell them for them. But I'm certainly right from Monsoon Wedding or any other. Uh, I have, uh, I, I live around it, I'm with it, and, and so on. And now, in actually translating the Varun character into the stage version has been also very interesting because now it's not just so simple because you can get into much more complicated things about it. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm open, but not uh, particularly thinking of it directly, you know. But seeing a lot, you know, seeing a lot, and loving it. Yeah. You have another question? Yeah. Um, hi, Mira. Uh, I really loved uh, whatever you spoke, and I'm just intrigued a little bit by uh, what you shared about lookbooks, mm -hmm. and I want to know um, if you can share. At what point, I mean, how much do you actually involve your core team when you, or is the lookbook primarily for your own creative process or do you share it with people that you discuss the ideas with? Just if you could talk a little about you that. You know, because I've always, with Lydia and others, I've always produced and financed my own films more or less all the time. So first, these books come from trying to con the person into financing <laughs> me, you know? <laughs> so it's like, you know, yeah. it could be a Gucci advertisement with the light, it could yeah. be uh, Raghu Rai or Raghuveer Singh's picture, or it could be, you know, it's an amalgam of images. Um, and then, when I raise the money, then, uh, 
uh, I make those books, uh, sometimes pretentiously called manifestos, where I interweave the scenes with them. The one scene, then here it could be this, and you know, this particular light or color, whatever it is that could inform that scene. And this I make, which is much more voluminous, and this is to be shared with the HODs, with the heads of department, with all my team. And the idea is to talk less when you're on the set. You know, to, right. to speak as much as you need to communicate to your fantastic army that is going to make these things happen. And so that I'm not talking from scratch. I really don't want to talk. I almost run a silent set, you know, because I have done the talking and now I'm responding to the environment and to the actor and to the whatever things that come my way. But to be, you know, in that blank slate to receive rather than to give. So it is a it, the books come as a process of giving to, right. to everyone. And sure, they have lots of input from the cinematographer and from the production designer by the time the manifesto kind of rolls around. Uh, so yeah, so it's, a, it's about communication, you know? And it's about um, them taking it and carrying it further. That's right. the big thing for me is to work with people, and I'm very, and I cherish them, who, who take the idea and build on it. And, and, you know, go, go, go the mile with it, rather than the competent person who just does what you're telling them to do. Right, yeah. and uh, since you also mentioned about photography, I just wanna, yeah. do you also use your own frames or like that you click in the lookbooks? No. Okay. Yeah, I can't yeah. stand that looking at your own work and thinking you're great. Uh, but yeah. but uh, uh, Amrita Shergil I use again and again. But yeah. no, I don't end up losing my own things. Because I don't you. want to step in the same river twice, right. in a sense, yeah. Thank, thank you, you so thank much, you. everyone. Thank you, Shona. Thank you.